annual glory to defenders of the Fatherland celebration in the Luzhniki Stadium, Moscow today. It was not the main event in diplomatic terms, but it's where we'll start. This is a world in which an old Soviet army song is reworked into rap by a Russian soldier fighting in Ukraine. For decades, Vladimir Putin has been modifying Russia's cultural DNA, pumping it full of patriotism without nuance and history without context. The result is this, a population by and large supportive of Putin's ill-fated invasion of Ukraine. Right now, there is a battle on our historical frontiers for our people. They are being led by the same kind of courageous fighters as those that are standing here now next to us. They are fighting heroically, courageously, bravely. We are proud of them. Before his stadium address, the meeting that really mattered today with Wang Yi, China's top diplomat. Against the backdrop of war in Ukraine, this represents one of the most important strategic relationships in the world right now. In the preamble for the cameras, Putin spoke about Russian-Chinese relations developing as planned and at pace. Wang Yi portrayed Moscow and Beijing as an axis of peace and stability in the world. And the message to the US, don't think you can bully us. What's more, we will not be overwhelmed by coercion and pressure from third parties. Russia is the junior partner here. China doesn't want that partner crippled by the war in Ukraine. That's why they're positioning themselves as peace broker. But how does that square with a recent warning from the US that China is considering sending weapons to assist Russia in its invasion of Ukraine? If that were to happen, and I know it sounds like you're not that convinced it would, it would, it would change everything, wouldn't it? It certainly would change everything, and it would also bring to the surface, I think, the fact that although Russia and China are very much aligned at the moment, their interests don't map entirely onto each other. So Russia has chosen to be a disruptor in the world. You know, it, it essentially exports energy and, and weapons. China exports everything. So to take on, on Russia's behalf, uh, the risk of upsetting its major markets, that's a, that's a big decision for China. On the last day of his European tour, President Biden's cavalcade in Warsaw greeted with the chant F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. En route to meet Central and Eastern European leaders, or with the odd exception, the we told you so bloc. The commitment of the United States to NATO, and I've said it to you many times, I'll say it again, is absolutely clear. We will defend literally every inch of NATO. In the last few hours, Biden's historic visit concluded. A second year of war in Europe is about to begin, with everything unsettled. But if the point of this visit was to demonstrate Western resolve and unity on Ukraine, it was by most standards a success. Parker Ryan reporting. Now, we try to speak to Russians close to President Putin, but it's not always easy. In fact, mostly it's impossible. But earlier I spoke to Yevgeny Popov, MP for President Putin's United Russia Party and the host of the influential 60 Minutes political news programme, which runs on the country's Russia state television channel. I put it to him that a Russian attack killed civilians at a bus stop in Kherson yesterday, witnessed by Lindsay Hilsom, at the very same time that President Putin was saying that he didn't want to fight the Ukrainian people. So, did that make the president a hypocrite? Uh, hypocrisy is uh, uh, the rule of uh, Western governments, not ours. Because, of course, we are not at war with uh, uh, Ukrainian people. <laughs> I can tell you, you even more. Them. My own relatives are now in Ukraine. And I can't be at war with my own relatives. Because we one people with Ukrainians, with most Ukrainians. And, of course, we are attacking only military infrastructure, only uh, military But you're objects. not. Sorry to and interrupt you. Yevgeny, I'm... I'm going to interrupt you there. You're not just 
attacking military targets. You're attacking civilian targets over and over again. Just this morning in Kharkiv, rockets, Russian rockets fired on uh, housing blocks, on civilian targets. Mariupol, um, everywhere. I mean, in, in Kiev, these are civilian targets that you have been going for since the beginning of this war a year ago, repeatedly. I can tell you again that uh, uh, civilians are not our target, and we are not at war with uh, civilians in Ukraine, and we are not, not at war with Ukrainian people. But it's a hypocrisy that you are uh, remembering about uh, civilians just now. Now, why didn't you remember about civilians during the last eight, uh, nine years? Would you tell me that? Uh, 14,000 people have been killed during the last nine years. Why didn't you remember civilians those numbers being are also, killed by Those numbers British are also in dispute. In when you say that Ukrainian civilians are not targeted by Russians, even though we see them dying on a daily basis, do you actually believe that? Do you believe that? I know that for sure. And I know that, of course, civilians are struggling in this war, during this war, uh, uh, Russia and NATO war, uh, because uh, uh, you can stop it uh, tomorrow uh, by stopping to deliver weapon to Ukraine, because you don't want to negotiate, uh, uh, you don't want to uh, uh, sit with uh, uh, Russia on a round table and discuss the tragic situation. Of course, we are not targeting civilians. Where do you think this war will end, realistically? Because at the moment, the Ukrainians are not going to give up. They want their, their country back. So how do you see this war ending? Of course, it's going to be a round table. And we should sit and negotiate peace sooner or later. Uh, you know, it's an unpopular topic here in Russia because everybody wants to get victory, because everybody wants to destroy the Nazi regime in Ukraine, because this regime have, been, have killed too many Russian and Ukrainian people already. Yeah. There is no Nazi regime in Ukraine. It just doesn't exist. So let me ask you, let's of try and stay in the Nazi realm regime. of reality here. If you, if, you cannot, if you cannot occupy the whole of this country, right, that seems impossible. Where do you see this war ending? Our people are dying in Ukraine because of the Nazi regime in Kyiv, and we must protect them. And our main goal is security guarantees for all our states. I think it will end... Mm. Uh, uh, shortly after we will negotiate uh, peaceful conditions, uh, all of us, not only Ukraine, because they are your puppet, uh, I mean Zelensky, but we should sit and discuss peace. Because if you're going to move your uh, NATO infrastructure uh, forward to our borders, there will not be uh, the end of this conflict. Do you think there's a danger that this could become a much wider conflict, a genuine conflict between Russia and NATO? Of course, I have uh, some kind of fear. Uh, but uh, nobody wants nuclear war because nobody survived nuclear war. And uh, I hope your politicians are pretty smart not to use uh, nuclear bombs mm. against us. We're not going to use it first. And uh, uh, it's but the can only, be but hold on a second, there. Evgeny. Sorry to interrupt you. The only people threatening, who threatened nuclear war in this, has been your president Vladimir Putin. He didn't do it. If you uh, carefully he has hearing, done it uh, on, on several yesterday. occasions. He just he he yesterday he didn't do it. You. But previously he's done he it. He clearly told you clearly that we're not gonna even taste nuclear yeah. weapon. First, but if you will taste nuke, we will do it. We will do it, of course. Yevgeny Popov, okay. thank you very much. Bye.